From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. Hello, and welcome to this JAMA Clinical Review Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mary McDermott, Deputy Editor of JAMA and Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Nicholas Madias, who is a nephrologist at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Boston and Professor of Medicine at Tufts. Dr. Madias is a senior author of a review on management of hyponatremia, which appeared in the July 19, 2022 issue of JAMA. Dr. Madias, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you. Good afternoon. So let's begin by having you discuss the three types of hyponatremia that you discuss in your review. And I wondered if you could discuss the pathophysiology of each type of hyponatremia, the signs and symptoms associated with each type of hyponatremia, and also give examples of specific underlying medical conditions that are associated with each type of hyponatremia. Thank you. Hyponatremia is defined as a decrease in serum sodium concentration below 135 mQ per liter and traditionally is divided into three types, hypovolemic, euvolemic, namely normal volume, and hypervolemic. In the euvolemic type, examples being uh, gastroenteritis, uh, a patient who has been overdiuresed, a patient who sustained a hemorrhage. What actually happens is that the effective circulating blood volume can decrease depending on the severity of the volume drop. And if it reaches about 15% of drop or more, it provides a hemodynamic stimulus to vasopressin release which is the antidiuretic hormone. Vasopressin is central to water homeostasis, and most types of hyponatremia are actually vasopressin-dependent. In this context, in hypovolemia, a baroreceptor-mediated stimulus to vasopressin release is created, and the urine concentration is promoted permeability of the collecting duct to water is increased, water retention happens, and uh, hyponatremia is generated. In euvolemic disorders, the extracellular fluid volume, as clinically assessed, is normal. And those disorders by far are represented by what we call the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis, And examples will be a malignancy like a small cell carcinoma of the lung or a subarachnoid hemorrhage or somebody who takes antidepressant like an SSRI. And uh, those uh, entities provide a stimulus to vasopressin release that is not osmotically regulated, so it's not hypertonicity, and it's not hemodynamic, namely a drop in the extracellular fluid volume. And for this reason, the syndrome is called inappropriate release of antidiuresis. And this increased vasopressin release, again, stimulates water reabsorption in the collecting duct, water retention and generation of hyponatremia. Now, there are some euvolemic disorders that are seen relatively rarely that are not vasopressin-dependent, and this will be a patient, for example, with a primary polydipsia who drinks excessively, and although the kidneys try to excrete that water, the amount of water ingestion and the tempo of this increase exceeds the capacity of the kidneys to excrete quantitative the water. So water retention happens and hyponatremia is generated. And finally, in hypervolemic disorders, like sodium retentive disorders, like heart failure, cirrhosis, or nephrotic syndrome, again, a hemodynamic stimulus to 
vasopressin release is activated through the reduction of the effective arterial volume, vasopressin is stimulated and hyponatremia is generated. As an exception, acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease, also hypervolemic disorders, generate hyponatremia, but not through vasopressin dependency. In those disorders, the decrease in glomerular filtration rate coupled with the inability of the diseased kidney to dilute the urine sufficiently generates water retention and hyponatremia. I should make one note that applies to all forms of hypotonic hyponatremia. You can have a water excreting defect as I described But to generate hyponatremia, the water ingestion must exceed the water losses from the kidneys or the extra kidney routes. So you need to create a positive water balance by having your water ingestion outstrip whatever capacity the kidneys and extra kidneys mechanism have to excrete the water. So what about the symptoms of hyponatremia? Can you discuss the symptoms and also distinguish between symptoms of acute and chronic causes of hyponatremia? Yes. In general, the symptoms of hyponatremia depend on the rapidity of development of the disorder, how severe the drop in serum sodium is, and what is the duration of the hyponatremia. Traditionally, we divide hyponatremia into an acute phase, which uh, conventionally is considered less than 48 hours, and a chronic disorder that is more than 48 hours. Now, when the hyponatremia develops, there is a gradual development of symptoms that initially are nonspecific, some headache, some weakness, But as the hyponatremia progresses in severity, we get symptoms from what we call hyponatremic encephalopathy. And this is an expression of hypotonicity-induced brain swelling. Because of the hypotonicity, water enters into the brain cells. And those symptoms are nausea, vomiting, disorientation, and then you progress to confusion, obtardation, somnolence, and depending again on the severity of the acute hyponatremia, seizures, you can get cardiovascular distress, respiratory distress from non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and you can even die from a respiratory arrest due to tentorial herniation. Soon after the development of hyponatremia, there is a defense mechanism that appears, which we call brain volume regulation. And the mechanism tries to decrease, in essence, the brain swelling that develops because of the hypotonicity. And what it involves is initially sodium, potassium, chloride, and water exit from the brain cells into the extracellular fluid. As the time progresses, loss of substances from the brain cell that we call organic osmolites, as examples, myositol, glutamate, along with water. And as a consequence, the symptoms from the same level of hyponatremia become markedly milder. Now, we used to think that chronic hyponatremia, namely of a duration greater than 48 hours, is asymptomatic. But this view has been now discredited, and we have to keep in mind that the chronic hyponatremia brain is not a normal brain. It's not normal because hypotonicity persists, and also the brain is depleted of electrolytes and osmolites, and those abnormalities are responsible for the residual symptoms. So what are the symptoms of chronic hyponatremia? Strikingly, 
mild chronic hyponatremia in older people has been shown to be associated with cognitive deficiencies, delayed in response times, gait disturbances and instability that can culminate actually in falls and what's worse, falls with fractures. Interestingly, these cognitive deficits and gait disturbances have been shown to be reversible with correction of the hyponatremia. However, when the chronic hyponatremia becomes worse, goes to moderate levels and severe levels, a fair number of patients develop, uh, express other symptoms like headaches, nausea, vomiting, restlessness, muscle cramps. They can develop confusion. They can have a tangential communicating process. And they can even develop seizures very rarely, but not the other cardiorespiratory consequences of acute hyponatremia. That's really interesting. And so are you saying that even an individual who has a chronic sodium of perhaps 133 or 134 could also develop some of those symptoms? Yes. Actually, studies have shown that, that patients with mild hyponatremia, again, in the elderly, are associated with those uh, symptoms. Very interesting. So when a patient presents with hyponatremia, what is your approach to delineating the underlying cause? So like with every other disease, I focus very much on the history and physical examination. And I try to really get as much information as quickly as I can. And the relevant questions for me are, does the patient have an acute illness, for example, a gastroenteritis? Or do they have a chronic illness potentially associated with hyponatremia, heart failure, cirrhosis? I ask quickly about medications that they take. I ask whether they had recent surgery or procedures because I'm thinking of various irrigants or the post-surgical, post-operative state, whether they have alcohol misuse. I try to understand if they have taken a lot of fluid, if they have lost a lot of fluid, what might be the fluid balance. Very importantly, I try, although I know it's difficult, to see if there is a weight change. Actually, a weight change is the best clinical criterion for declaring somebody hypovolemic. And I try to ask uh, whether the patient recalls having other episodes of hyponatremia in the past. And then I proceed with a clinical assessment of the extracellular fluid volume, as I indicated, to hypovolemia, euvolemia, or hypervolemia. And at the same time, as I examine the patient, I try to assess their neurological status because if I consider the patient as having symptoms consistent with an active, developing hyponatremic encephalopathy, I will try to prepare them quickly for emergency management. And I try through my physical examination also to uncover signs of comorbidities, for example, heart failure, cirrhosis, chronic kidney disease, and the like. What are some of the more common medications that you're looking for that can cause hyponatremia? Well, in terms of medications, I'm thinking of the antidepressants, SSRIs, tricyclics, uh, antipsychotics, phenothiazine, and the others. I'm thinking of thiazides. I'm thinking of various anticonvulsants, carbamazepine, valproic acid. I'm thinking of uh, non-steroidals, PPIs, and so on. Now let's discuss the management of hyponatremia. Which patients require immediate correction of hyponatremia? And for those patients, what treatments do you recommend? Now, regardless of duration, and I say that with emphasis, and this is because it's very difficult most of the times to be certain about the duration of the hyponatremia. Only in a postoperative state 
induced hyponatremia, one can be certain. So for this reason, I emphasize, regardless of duration, symptoms with severely symptomatic hyponatremia, namely somnolence, coma, seizures, cardiorespiratory distress. And patients who have moderately symptomatic hyponatremia, namely vomiting confusion, but they are at high risk of life-threatening complication, namely to evolve quickly to high risk. For example, a marathoner who is brought to the hospital, who is vomiting, says, I have severe nausea, headache, appears to have a tangential way of communication, I will consider them an indication for emergency management, even if they don't have yet the severe symptoms. And then I will also think that patients who have pre-existing intracranial, whether neurological or neurosurgical pathology, let's say somebody with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, somebody with a traumatic brain, some uh, uh, post-hypophysectomy person, With hyponatremia, we consider them appropriate indications for emergency management because any further drop in sodium can add to the brain swelling and evolve into severe complications. Now, most of these patients that require emergency management have what I will call acute euvolemic hyponatremia. It will be the postoperative state primary polydipsics, acute intoxication like uh, intense exercise, people who have been in rave parties and have taken ecstasy, some other drugs, oxytocin, and so on. But also I want to emphasize the pre-existing intracranial pathology and also small numbers, but definitely present, acute hyponatremic patients in which acute hyponatremia has been superimposed on chronic hyponatremia, can have severe symptomatology, and also patients with extreme chronic hyponatremia, let's say 110 or less, secondary to thiazides, other drug, can also present with severe symptomatology. So, yes, most of the patients are acute, but we have to keep in mind that acute on chronic And severe chronic can present with the severe symptomatology that actually calls for emergency management. Now, in terms of how to address these patients, both existing guidelines, the United States guideline and the European guideline, agree that we have to treat them with boluses of hypertonic saline, namely 3% hypertonic saline, And they have defined very nice goals for this treatment. They say that we have to try within an hour or two to increase the sodium by four to six milliequivalents per liter because experience from uh, exercise-induced hyponatremia and also the neurosurgical literature shows that rapid increase in sodium by that amount is sufficient to reverse the most ominous consequence of hyponatremic encephalopathy. Now, obviously, doing that requires very close monitoring of the patients in terms of vital signs, neurological status, urine output, fluid administration, and so on. And how about management of patients with chronic hyponatremia who one might be seeing in the outpatient setting? First of all, what's the most common cause of hyponatremia in the outpatient setting and what is the most appropriate management? Yes, the most common by far cause of patient hyponatremia is uh, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis. So euvolemic hyponatremia, which I would say 95% will be SIAD, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis. And this is a syndrome that was defined by Barter and Schwartz back in the 1957, and its criteria remained virtually identical as described at that time. So we're talking about hypotonic hyponatremia in a clinically euvolemic patient 
that has inappropriate concentrated urine and we define it as greater than 100 milliosmos per kilogram or a specific gravity 103. So despite the fact that the patient is hypotonic and the serum sodium is down, the urine is not maximally dilute, but it has an osmolality greater than 100. There is plentiful sodium in the urine, usually greater than 30 milliequivalents per liter, and we have to be careful to exclude the presence of adrenal, pituitary, severe hypothyroid, pituitary disease, severe hypothyroidism, and kidney disease. Now, I want to emphasize this because uh, work coming out of real work, uh, diagnosis and management of hyponatremia shows that the SIAD is not appropriately diagnosed using the criteria that I described. In over 47%, so uh, actually less than 50% of the cases, the appropriate serum and urine measurements are not done And only in the small minority of patients, hypocortisolism, severe thyroid disease have been excluded. So we have to keep in mind that SID is a diagnosis of exclusion. We have to make sure that we exclude first abnormalities in uh, adrenal, pituitary, kidney function, thyroid function, and that the appropriate criteria are met. Now, having done that, some causes can be reversible. For example, if the cause is a drug, if we can stop the drug, we cure the hyponatremia. Sometimes, of course, we cannot do that. But if we can stop the drug, that's curative. If the SIAD is secondary to a pneumonia, treating the pneumonia with antibiotics reverses the hyponatremia. On the other hand, In many situations, SID is irreversible, secondary, for example, to malignancies, to some chronic pulmonary conditions, secondary to drugs that you cannot discontinue. In a good fraction of patients, actually, especially in older patients, there is no identifiable cause of the hyponatremia. It's idiopathic. So what we do is the first-line treatment is fluid restriction. And in general, we try to reduce fluid intake to less than a liter and a half. And depending on some prognosticator criteria, we can, we might have to go even farther to less than a liter. I have to say that I have always considered this therapy harsh. And also I want to emphasize that it's not physiology driven because the patient with SID does not have hyponatremia because they drink a lot, it's because they have a water excreting defect. Be that as it may, we try to fluid restrict. Experience shows that it's not an effective treatment. If successful, the increase in sodium is meager, and also it's difficult to be sustained. And this is because actually most patients cannot really maintain substantial fluid restriction. Think of a patient who takes drugs, has a malignancy, dry mouth, takes all sorts of many other drugs, and to have also to adhere to a substantial fluid restriction. So if this does not work, we move to second-tier treatments. This does not say that we cannot supplement the second-tier treatments with a measure of fluid restriction, but we can also use them in their own right, by themselves. And these modalities that try to increase the solute intake and to do so to increase water excretion by the kidneys. And these are increasing uh, salt intake, and this can be through dietary means or through salt tablets, and works well if actually we add a little bit of furosemide, 20 to 40 milligrams per day, a modest effect. In many countries of the world, but not in the United States, in the United States it's just catching up, administering urea to produce osmotic diuresis can be very effective, and it has been shown that it can be effective in the long term. 
given 15 to 60 grams of urea daily can have a very good effect in producing substantial diuresis and repair of a decreased sodium. And a new preparation in the United States that is citrus flavored has improved a lot palatability and I'm hopeful that uh, this preparation will be used increasingly in the United States as well. It's good treatment. We try to increase protein intake because quite often patients with SID, especially the older patients, do not take enough nutrition and enough protein. And we try to reinstate their protein intake because through generating urea does what I just described before. It decreases water excretion. There is early information that embacliflozin, which is a sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor, an anti-diabetic drug that has been shown to have beneficial effect in patients with diabetes, too, in patients with chronic kidney disease, and patients with heart failure, has an effect to produce a modest increase in serum sodium. But these are early studies. There is an ongoing study going on, and I'm eagerly awaiting the results. The last major medication for increasing uh, water excretion are the Vaptans, And I consider them the most physiologic, actually, way of treating the syndrome of inappropriate ADH because competitively it antagonizes vasopressin on engaging the vasopressin 2 receptor in the principal cells of the collecting duct. And we have a a drug that can be used only in the hospital, conivaptan, for four days, and an oral medication, tolvaptan, that is initiated in the hospital and then given out patient and can be given chronically, that is very, very effective in producing a sustained increase in plasma sodium. There are some complications. It increases thirst, and obviously the patient is uh, having lots of urine, is polydipsic. It can produce overcorrection of hyponatremia on the order of 10 up to 30%. This is a concern because if one increases the serum sodium of a patient with chronic hyponatremia substantially, I would say above 10 to 12 milliequivalents in the first 24 hours, a rare but devastating syndrome can occur, which we call osmotic demyelination, uh, which can have a devastating consequence and even death. So efforts are being done to teach clinicians of how to best use these drugs. And one major direction is that doses less than what is currently recommended, current recommendation is to start with 15 milligrams per day. So a dose of seven and a half milligrams a day and potentially smaller, early studies suggest that it can be as effective and safer than the dose of 15 milligrams or so. Well, Dr. Medias, this has been an incredibly informative interview. I'm wondering, are there any final comments that you have about diagnosing and managing hyponatremia? Yes, thank you. There was an evaluation of the real-world experience with diagnosis and management of hyponatremia in the United States and countries of the European Union back in 2010-2013, which showed that the diagnosis and management of hyponatremia are suboptimal. For example, as I indicated before, the diagnostic evaluation of the SIAD, the most prevalent cause of hyponatremia, is very suboptimal. And then the treatment of hyponatremia is suboptimal in the sense that about 50% of patients admitted to the hospital for hyponatremia were discharged still hyponatremic. So I really think that it's important to repeat a study like this to see whether the development of a codified 
response to diagnostic treatment through the United States guidelines and the European guidelines in 2013, 2014, respectively, and through the advent of uh, more drugs and more information about optimal management, whether we are doing better currently. The second direction that I think deserves to be explored is optimization of the treatment of severely symptomatic hyponatremia because the administration of boluses of hypertonic saline achieves its goal to get to a goal of four to six, let's say, milliequivalents increase of serum sodium quickly, but it has what I consider an acceptable overcorrection of hyponatremia on the order of 20% or so, and that while about 40% of patients are required to have relowering efforts to relower the sodium with administration of 5% dextrose and desmopressin during, let's say, the first day of administration. So there's no question that more effort is required how to optimize the administration of hypertonic saline. Another direction that I think is important to do studies that compare current treatments for long-term therapy. For example, the Vaptans against uh, urea, against increased salt and administration of furosemide to see whether there is a differential impact in terms of the consequence of hyponatremia, the need for hospitalization, the utilization of resources, uh, morbidity and mortality and so on. And one point that I would like very much to make is that the clinicians should always remember that co-administration of potassium along with other treatments treats not only potassium depletion but hyponatremia. For every retention of one milliequivalent of potassium, the impact on sodium is as if you have retained one milliequivalent of sodium. And several cases of osmotic demyelination that have occurred are because potassium chloride was co-administered with other treatments designed to treat the hyponatremia. I'm Mary McDermott, Deputy Editor of JAMA, and I've been speaking today with Dr. Nicholas Medias about his recently published review on the diagnosis and management of hyponatremia. You can find a link to the published paper in the description of this podcast. This podcast was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. The audio team here also includes Jesse McWhorters, Shelley Steffens, Lisa Hardin, Audrey Foreman, and Mary Lynn Ferkeluk. Dr. Robert Golub is the JAMA Executive Deputy Editor. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.